Good afternoon. We're excited to have all of you joining us online. We're um, getting a few more people coming in. We uh, um, see a few people are just hopping into the to the waiting room, and we're also waiting for our speaker to come on. He was um, back to back on some meetings, so we're all kind of keeping an eye on him coming into the waiting room as well. But we are excited to um, welcome you this afternoon. And as we get started this afternoon, I'm going to open us with a time of prayer, and then I'm going to toss it to Marie, and she can tell us a little bit about um, our speaker for today and uh, kind of get us started into our time together. So uh, I'm just going to do an opening prayer today from our um, ELW, and it's the prayer for the Vigil of Pentecost, um, since not many of us probably have a Vigil of Pentecost. I found this to be um, to be kind of a, just a, a neat prayer to share. So, from the Vigil of Pentecost, Pentecost, let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you fulfilled the promise of Easter by sending the gift of your Holy Spirit. Look upon your people gathered in prayer, open to receiving the Spirit's flame. May it come to rest in our hearts and heal the divisions of word and tongue that with one voice and one song, we may praise your name in joy and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Maria, we'll toss it over to you and you can tell us about um, our speaker for today and uh, kind of how this hour is going to unwind. Thank you. Well, I am very excited to be with you all today, but also very excited for my beloved friend, Mike Griffin, uh, who will be kind of guiding us through a conversation um, about Minneapolis, about community organizing, relational organizing. Um, just a little background. Mike and I graduated uh, from high school together um, about 17 years ago, and then um, uh, we moved to Minneapolis. So Mike uh, attended University of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I was at Bethel. And we've stayed in contact because of the joy of social media. Um, but I have been one of his yeah. biggest uh, cheerleaders for quite some time. And it is even more exciting now because he was accepted into Luther Seminary. And so we have a new Lutheran pastor coming up in the rain starting this fall. I am beyond excited. Um, Mike is and always has been incredibly passionate um, about any issue or any person or any human. Um, he is a lover. He is just a good person. And so I am honored um, to have him here with us. Um, and so Mike, this is the South Central Synod Equipping the Saints. And so these webinars are to just have conversation. Um, during the pandemic, they started to um, just help us be together when we couldn't be, um, helped us kind of interact with what was happening in our world. And as leaders, what do we do in our churches and how do we navigate through some conversations? And the one of uh, post, you know, George Floyd's murder um, was difficult. And for a lot of us, we don't know how to navigate through these conversations, especially, um, you know, even in our homes, but then in our churches, how do we talk? How do we bring these conversations to the forefront. And so I just hope and pray that you are able to give us a snippet of all that you know and all that you've experienced. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of have a dialogue, he and I, and then for all of you that are here, um, if there's questions that come up, you can pop those in the chat, but we'll also open up at the end um, for there to be some more uh, conversation um, or just, you know, interaction with what Mike has, has shared with us. And so, um, Mike, if you want to just start and introduce yourself, but also okay. just where are you at kind of right now in Minneapolis? Yes, we are. I'm in Minneapolis, as Marie just said. But um, I want to take you back to high school where me and Marie met. Uh, it was, you know, one of my good close friends in high school was Marie. One story that she's leaving out is that we graduated from Brookfield Central. Brookfield Central is about 95% white. I would say uh, probably top 10% of affluent community in this country. Uh, and Mike Griffin, very opinionated black self, 
uh, got my chomps in arguing and being agitational uh, in high school. Um, and then I went to college at the University of Minnesota, where uh, then Senator Barack Obama started running for president. Uh, and I never really looked back. I became an organizer for him, multiple states, uh, came back to Minnesota, uh, finished up and got a degree, uh, worked a little bit in his administration. Uh, and then I started like really leaning in locally, where I was a part of the ballot initiative to defeat the marriage campaign uh, here. Uh, they wanted to enshrine hatred in our constitution here in Minnesota. Uh, and then I had left that job and I started leaning into just black organizing, where I was uh, a central organizer in North Minneapolis. That is where the concentration of most black people live. Uh, in that organization, we did racial justice. We also did economic justice. Um, and part of the um, part of the connection between race, the economy, and also criminal justice. To Marie's point, in Minnesota, we've had a long year. Uh, but this campaign for police accountability didn't just start last summer. As somebody who's been on the ground organizing in Minneapolis, I know that the community was demanding for police accountability when Jamar Clark was killed about five years ago, shot in the back, some say while handcuffed. That campaign, we took over the fourth precinct um, where it was in our blood to really look at police precincts as symbols of white supremacy. I remember Philando Castile shot with his daughter in the back seat that was streamed live on Facebook. That officer was charged, but then found not guilty. And I think we all know and saw what happened uh, on the streets of Minneapolis uh, almost a year ago next week. Um, so we have been demanding this uh, in Minneapolis for a while. And so the watching uh, Brother George cry out uh, for eight and a half minutes uh, really changed the trajectory of the Black Lives Matter movement in this country. Um, and so it, it went from, I would consider it a, a uh, that. niche organization that dealt with a particular policy issue that some folks decided to opt in or out to a national conversation that was in the middle of a presidential election that a lot of our white allies who are now leaning into what can we do as a society to make sure that Black Lives Matter, not only with policing, but in the economy and housing and jobs and opportunity. For example, Luther Seminary are prioritizing folks who look like me to get go to the master's program with something called the Jubilee Scholarship. I could not have attended Luther Seminary without prioritizing that scholarship that actually looked like people like me. So that was a whole lot that I gave you, but this is to say, like, I believe that this is a pivotal moment in our country where we are, where the Black Lives Matter movement has turned from like black folks demanding injustice to a national movement where white folks are actually need to lean in. Uh, congregations really need to lean in. Churches really need to lean in. So I'm thankful for this conversation. And I know I'm here as like the speaker and leader, but I really wanted to make this a conversation about how can we all lean in and make sure that Black lives in my life matter. Mm. Ugh, thank you. What, what has been your personal experience with Black Lives Matter? So we're in a world now where we, and, and some of us are in those congregations and communities where we hear Black Lives Matter and then the immediate response is all lives matter, right? So we have that response. What is your personal experience and even how do you respond when that situation in, in context happens? What's your personal experience with Black Lives Matter when you've been literally on the grounds of these, these Minneapolis protests? Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a big pushback. Um, when you say Black Lives Matter, you say All Lives Matter. Uh, that, um, and we agree, like definitely all lives do matter in this country. Uh, but I like to look at it as like, um, my grandmother passed away from lung cancer. Uh, and I'm gonna make donations to lung cancer and I'm gonna wear a yellow ribbon in March for lung cancer. That's not to take away from other movements 
around like beating other forms of like diseases or cancers, right? And particularly this context, we're talking about folks who are most likely to be harmed by the police department. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking about, and the police department is a function of our government, is that we like to look at police as protect and serve, and these are good, good folks. And so it's particularly harmful when police are the aggressors in the community. And because the police are the more aggressive to the community, we can just talk about facts. We can just talk about like, I feel like we could, we're all in a, a space now having watched George Floyd to say that would not have happened to my Caucasian brothers and sisters. That particularly the aggression of police officers to black men is greater because there's a fear mindset of um, black men. So a lot of the pushback is all lives matter, but I try to say yes, all lives matter. But in this context, we want to talk about who is most affected. We want to talk about equality and equity. If we want to do that, like we have to actually prioritize those who have been historically greatly impacted by these issues that we have in this country. And I would say, I like to take it a step further and say that yes, police have the aggression against black men that we all agree on. And the reason that police are show that aggression was because we as a society have degraded black people that officers like Derek Colvin believe that they can get away with that on broad daylight while teenagers videotaped him. And let me take you on this journey. I believe that because of what I've seen literally in some organizing spaces here in Minneapolis. So on the ground, I was pushing something called fair scheduling in Minneapolis, which was a fair scheduling and sick time and $15 an hour, where I would literally bring thousands of workers to City Hall, black workers demanding for a living wage in Minneapolis, not $7, but a living wage, um, that if you work the full-time week, you deserve to actually have a living wage concept that most of us agree with, especially 13 Democrats that were elected on city council. Thousands of black people, months and months and months. Three white business owners, one, two, three, I can name the, I can name the restaurants who are in downtown, spoke up against our economic justice campaign, three of them, and that pulled it from, uh, being even considered how we value white business owners in this country three of them compared to thousands of black workers is because even our democratic elected officials value some people more than others and so my agitation to my white friends is not just let's look at the police force and say what are they doing to transform because yes they need to do a whole lot to transform but what can we do Lutherans, what can we do Christians? What can we do my white brothers and sisters in our daily lives to make sure that black folks life actually matters? Um, and so yes, we need to fix the police force. Yes, we need $15 an hour. But yes, we need scholarships for people who look like me to go to Luther seminary. Yes, we need to think about like, if my son or daughter dated someone that looked like me, would I be a little bit anxious? If I moved in next door to you, it. it would that be okay? These are questions that we internally all need to start asking ourselves to try to dismantle in this country the reason why we're in this mess. Yes, it's police force, but it's also what can we do internally uh, and agitate that out as well. Yeah. yeah, and thank you for that that challenge to us is that that's what we ask all the time is what what can we do and what what are we allowed to do? What are we meant to do? What does it mean to love your neighbor? What does it mean to be created all, right? How, how does that, these are questions we deal with all the time, but in the midst of this disruptive world is that now that question is even more apparent of, we need to answer it, right? We can't just keep asking it and, and having just conversations or reading more books. That's all great. And that helps us, us learn, it helps us grow, but there's that piece of, we need to start answering it together and collectively um, for our communities and, and for our brothers and sisters of color. We have to. 
Um, what what's happening like right now on the grounds in Minneapolis? What is your organization um, kind of figuring out, or or what are you leaning into in this space right now? Yeah. So um, right now we have a municipal election that's coming up uh, in November, ranked choice voting election. Uh, there also will be multiple ballot initiatives. We are right now having a citywide conversation on what the future of policing is gonna look like in this city. Um, so there are folks in both camps, whether it's defund, abolish, dismantle, however you wanna look at it. Uh, I lean into it, my organization really leans into it as two things. Um, one is that whether we call it the police force or some other name, right? What stops white vigilantes from coming in? What stops KKK from coming in? What stops some secret private police force from the suburbs that is like to, to defend businesses here? Um, so I, if, if, if it's just about the name that we're using for, for a protective force, I think we're missing the ball. So I think we need to fundamentally think about what safety looks like. Um, and that, that's reimagining is it an armed police officer necessarily pulling us over and addressing all of our problems that we run into. Police officers in this country respond to everything from my partner forgetting to take his medicine to I have a drama with my neighbor to I forget to use my left turn signal to turn. Police armed white police officers are the folks who reply to those type of situations. Um, so us rethinking what safety looks like, not necessarily thinking about the name of this force, but what are they replying to um, in our country? And that's kind of rethinking, like if white folks continue to call not 911, but 711, and it's a secret force that comes in that could be doing more harm than what we have right now. So um, I, I necessarily don't think it's about the wording, it's about necessarily how we are valuing safety. Mm -hmm. Two is that we, our budgets are our moral documents. And every municipality basically decides the funding for said police force. So in Minneapolis has their own funding, St. Paul own funding, all the suburbs, they're all municipalities had their own funding. Usually state uh, offices have less to do with funding police officers that pull you over are gonna reply. Minneapolis has a billion dollar budget. We choose as a society, we're choosing as people who live in the city to spend $200 million, 20% of that on a militarized unaccountable police force that only one cop has been found guilty and that was the cop who killed Joe Ford. Like, like we're choosing to do that. And so what my organization is really trying to lean into is how can we pressure local municipalities to shift this from a police state to a caring economy, that these budgets are actually our moral documents. And if 10% of that, 20% of that, 30, half of that can actually go into programs to address historic discrimination that we've had. We know in Minneapolis, we've had a horrible retina lining. The reason why black people live in North Minneapolis was because they were forced there. It was traditionally white Jews that lived in North Minneapolis. Now it's all black people. And the reason why is because there was discrimination. Can we imagine a policy that the city of Minneapolis takes 10% of that budget and invest that into home ownerships, prioritizing people of color? Can we imagine us, I need therapy in this city I need therapy and I got one. Black people in this city also need therapy. Can we prioritize free therapy? Everybody in Minneapolis, specifically black folks, can we like fund the black therapist because I can't find one uh, in, that's, been, that's from Minneapolis. So um, I think there, there's a way for us to lean in on city and municipal budgets that isn't necessarily trying to say, what word we're using to define safety, but what are our budgets going to use to make sure my life matters is what we're actually leaning into. And, and thank you for that work. And thank you for the, even just the, um, excuse me, uh, this, the studying to it is, 
there's a lot of history here that we're just so in a sense unaware of and and apologetically I, I didn't know about a lot of this until it comes forth and so your work in that is is crucial and very important so thank you for that um you'd mentioned a little bit earlier and so the people majority of us on this call um are either you know rostered leaders in churches their lay leadership their seminary students that are um you know looking to be in a church someday they believe in ministry right um and we're here and so you mentioned that you know, churches need to lean in, right? We need to lean in, our communities need to step in. So I wanna kind of turn the conversation to um, what, when you say that, what is your encouragement? What is your empowerment to us? You come from a long line of pastors, mm -hmm. um, whether they were ordained or it's just your parents or your mom. I mean, you have a lot of people and you're like that, you are a church family. You are born and raised in the church. You've seen it grow, you've seen it um, decline. Um, and here we are in a space where there's pastors here in the South Central Synod, which you know could be anywhere from Madison proper city. Um, there could be rural churches here. There are you know farming communities. There's bedroom communities, suburbs. Um, we we don't know what to do when we hear we need to lean in. Um, we don't know that when someone in our congregation um, says we can't talk about that. We don't talk, we don't talk about that here. Um, how do we talk about it and, and stop with the kind of the fluff and the sugar coating? Um, how do we as pastors, as people that work with, with our members, with our communities, where do we start? Or what suggestions do you have that we could? Because we have to. Yes. Um, I think that's a big question and I feel like uh, as I go to L Luther Seminary, I'm going to learn some more tactics, uh, but I will say um, meeting people where they at. Um, I think that's a flippant way of saying um, I, I think we lean into uh, the brick and mortar Sunday morning uh, um, uh, way of opting into faith establishments. Um, and not have a multiple avenues for people to opt in. And that's just not like Wednesdays at seven or Sundays at eight. Um, and I feel like the pandemic kind of forced us into other ways of re how, we, how we need to reimagine policing, how we're re reimagining faith. Um, but yeah, I think meeting people where they're at. So uh, part of my Easter, was um, me going to a brunch with my friends and like uh, the pastor uh, who's a Methodist pastor, but we planted a tree outside and we had a brunch and we uh, talked a little bit about, just a little bit about scripture, uh, but it was a community space and we did something good for the environment and we, he connected, I can't do off the top of my head, why the tree was important to Easter. Um, and I think things like that, people who um, look like me, who are, uh, who are less likely to wake up early on Sundays. So people who are less likely to wake up early, right? People who might work in restaurants, the, the are like, as generations have come, right? And work ethics have changed, the church static Sunday morning hasn't evolved with it. So a, a lot of folks who are, young African-American are working in restaurants or having weekend jobs. Um, and those people might not be able to opt into those times. So I think just the flexibility around um, places to opt in. Um, and I will say um, there's, there's a theory of what's called relational organizing that we can have a whole nother call about this. Um, Corporate America has really like learned this. So if you have like the Snicker bars that are in two different packages or break off a Kit Kat or the Coke with a name on it, that you buy a Coke to hand it to somebody else. Relational organizing, corporate America is like leaned in. My day job, electing people at office, elections, we're trying to lean into this theory of relational organizing. It's far more effective for me to talk to my bartender or barber or pastor uh, than for a commercial or for a stranger to knock on my door. 
stranger knock on my door is not as effective as my friend Marie Leaflat talking to me. And so we have been really trying to lean into how can we use our existing base to grow it to talk to more people. And I'm encouraging faith to also do that. Like the billboard outside of churches that you drive and look at, it's not gonna reach people. Even going out knocking on a stranger's door isn't as technology savvy and like where I feel like the world is with like targeting um, is that we can be a lot more sophisticated in how we're inviting members, the tactics that we're using once they get there to get them in the door um, and who we're inviting. I've learned that it's, 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 y'all not gonna love this, um, but it's not the message as much as the messenger. It's not the message as much as the messenger. Well, we can get a lot more folks in our congregation using a messenger, right? Because you can change that to like a, appeal to that one person uh, to get that person in the door. So I, it's, it's, um, it's a wonky, technologies that we can use there's apps there's different ways to track it we ran into a scenario where um i do black organizing and churches were closed and we were trying to educate folks to take the COVID 19 vaccine and because churches were closed us delivering that message out to rural mississippi uh, was challenging in my day job. And one way we actually leaned in was having faith communities in a rural Mississippi actually talk to their members digitally and have those members talk to their friends and family about like, take a picture of you with the shot and post it on Facebook. And how we're communicating is not necessarily in churches doing like months and months ago, I get their opening back up. Uh, but it, it, this is all to say like, there are unique technology driven ways of how we can meet people, find people and communicate with people. Um, and that's a way to actually lean in. Yeah, and that's just the start, that relational piece. I mean, that's, that's the foundation of how churches make it, right? We have a, we have a gospel message that is, is relationship. Like Jesus sat with people, he, he didn't, always do these grandiose you know sermon on the mounts every he sat with people he looked at people he noticed people and he embraced those conversations and that's what we're asked to as believers we embrace that message that we need to do that in our own communities and as difficult as it is because of the stereotypes we've put on the the things we've known from history or what we've heard before from our family or friends we lean in to that message that the gospel provides for us as a relational God, is that we have that ability to sit, to sit with people and to listen and to hear. Um, it's slow to speak. It's, it's listening to their stories and embracing that. Um, and that message, um, that's what works when there's a relational aspect to it. Um, right. when, when, you hear, when, you, when you say um, white allies, um, how how can how can you become how can you do like as a white person how can i say i am a white ally right rather than just being like well i'm just not racist like what how do i separate that and go i know that i am a white ally and what do i do with that um because there's a difference um you know there's a difference when you when you say that you are a white ally and so could you speak to that just a little bit to help some of us Yes, um, I think I'm into actions and less words. Uh, so I do like the hashtag Black Lives Matter. I love that churches are actually putting that on their bulletin board that when I drive past all over Minneapolis. Um, I would love more uh, in uh, actively engaging congregations on white supremacy of white privilege of um, divesting from like hate and police force into a caring economy. Um, I think hard conversations about race and equity in the history of this country, um, I feel like it's harder to do. Uh, but what that does is that it takes it away. I think a lot of white folks 
like to position themselves as saying Black Lives Matter and also saying it's somebody else's problem. Somebody else needs to deal with it. You are the problem, not me. Deflect, deflect, deflect. Um, and just pointing at police forces. Um, and churches actually, because you're more vulnerable and you're in a pot with relational people that you know, is actually a good time to reflect on what actually can you do in your life to make you a better person. There's an arc of everybody can become more just in their life. There's not like the, you get an all-star button. Like once you hit get level 10 and you're all done, we're always growing and becoming more and more um just and loving and like right and so um i think that that is what happens to that is like a conversation that needs to happen to have people wrestle with those conversations because the issues that i'm seeing are white people who still will lock their door if i'm walking past them on the street right like white women who are across the street because they're afraid when i walk past them like though those still microaggressions add to the degradation of black people that leads to people like Derek Colvin choking out George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And the only time we can start to unpack that is if we're starting to have these difficult conversations at that raw level, right? Uh, about like, what are, what are some of my faults? What are I'm struggling with? Um, and those are vulnerabilities that we don't like to do. <laughs> we love to say it's somebody else's fault. Let's let me hold them accountable and let me cancel that person. I can't believe that, 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 that. But what we actually need to do is like self reflect on ourselves. How would you feel if your son was gay and they walked in with me? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I, I think that those are questions that we should wrestle with. Um, and I think church is a good opportunity for us to do that. If and and I think also is one of the only places because of that relational organizing. Like, other than my pastor and my barber, like my bartender are like my best therapy sessions I have where I'm actually the most vulnerable. Uh, and so I think congregations is just a, another point for us to lean in about like having those difficult conversations with ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. And you and I had had this conversation too, but a friend of mine um, who is a, a black man in Milwaukee, he and I were just kind of joking one day and. I had explained to him how many times I've been pulled over. And I was joking back, it used to be kind of my shtick is that I joked of like, I've been pulled over a stupid amount of times. And I would always say like, and I've only gotten like a couple tickets out of the deal. And I was like, it was a shtick. And he and I were talking and he's like, okay. And this was shortly after George Floyd. And, and this was, this is very tense, especially in Milwaukee too, because we all are very aware of how segregated even Milwaukee is. And so he and I were talking and, and I, I said, you know, does that upset you? And he goes, well, here's the difference. He goes, when you get pulled over, what goes through your mind? And I go, well, I'm going to be either late for work or how fast was I really going? And he goes, difference here is I think about, is this the last time I'm going to be alive? And I, I got hit so hard with it that I couldn't even say a word. And from that processing that I had to do, because I don't want to do that. I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to think that I've my shtick or my jokes were hurtful. And it's not so much that it hurt him as a black man. It's a perspective is that right there was my white privilege that I got to use as a joke and have fun with it, right? And so when, when we even talk about white privilege is, can you speak to that just a little bit too about kind of even what does privilege even mean? So as a black man that's in Minneapolis that has seen you know your white brothers and sisters on the grounds too, like what does privilege even mean? And, and as a church, how do we even address it in our, predominantly white congregations. What, what do we do to step into to that piece? Yeah, um, I think it's hard to define privilege without giving an example. Um, and what you just did is example of your white privilege. What the story you just told to everybody on this call is a microcosm of your white privilege. And I feel like we can just like own that. And I feel like we, there's levels of white privilege that you have because when you get pulled over it's a stick and joke when we get pulled over it's actually like oh my goodness my life and because of that 
there's a heightened view of anxiety when I leave the house compared to everybody else who is white on this call, mm -hmm. right? And that lightness that white people have, that this is a stick that we could use and not a life-threatening event, right? That's a lightness and privilege that we walk around with. Mm -hmm. And the fear and the trauma and the anxiety of every day, not being able to change my color, but I can pretend to be straight, right, when I leave the house. But, but, but that type of almost crippling fear when you're pulled over um, is hard to articulate. But I feel like that prime example is privilege. And what churches can do is engage that conversation that we just did um, on, at a level of understanding my experience pulled over versus your experience pulled over. And what now happens what are the consequences from all of that, right? Um, and what can we all do to move forward? So I think it's, it's always hard to define. If we're doing it in a congregational setting, I would, I would as church leaders lean into moments of your privilege. Lean into it. I, I get on the light rail here, it's a train, me and my white roommate, where there's like a cop that will come over and just like ask people for, like their ticket or whatever to make sure that they paid their dollar fifty, and if you didn't pay your dollar fifty, you actually get a two hundred dollar fine. So they would walk up to not walk up to my white roommate. We walk in together and beeline it over to me and like ask me for my ticket, which of course I paid for because I know if you don't do it one time, is a one time they actually going to find you. So it it's like those type of things where just like water off your back, not that big of a deal. I have to prove my ticket. Um, but those type of situations are, I feel like examples that if you can think about it in your life, if you can lean into your own vulnerability as a way of an example for your congregation to do it as well, um, would be a way for us to like have a conversation for us to start wrestling with our own like microaggressions that people do every day. Yeah, thank you for that. And you know, when, when we hear um, community organizing, um, even that, um, what, what does that look like? What, what is, when you say it's, I'm a community organizer, um, you, you spoke a little bit to that, but um, what if I wanna be a community organizer? Um, what if my church needs to move into a space that they wanna do some anti-racial you know racial work? They wanna, they wanna be a part of this. They're, they're revved up, they're challenged. They've, you know, they've, they've discerned this for their congregation. What does community organizing even mean? Yeah, so I look at community organizing as it's now a profession now. It's a professionalized profession since Obama's thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually think that it's, it's, it could be anybody. It, I look at my dad as a organizer. He was a pastor. I looked at my mom, who was a kindergarten teacher, as an organizer as well, parents in her classroom. Uh, there are activists now, Black Lives Matter organizers, who aren't paid a dollar. Um, so I think part of what an organizer is, is someone who's willing to bring people together, like a church, find collective problems. What's the issue that we all have? And now what are solutions to those problems? For example, your church might find a collective problem is we don't have broadband internet, or we don't have water, or police are too aggressive, or da, 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 da. the list can go on and on and on. But anybody that brings people together, that finds collective problems, and then tries to find solutions to people collective problems, I would argue is an organizer. Um, I was training organizers in Eastern Europe and there were, um, just a quick story, uh, there was someone who had to walk through a park to get to a bus stop every day. Every day she walked through the park, she got poop on her shoes. And she came back home and she dragged poop all over her house. Uh, the next week she went and she met somebody else in the workroom who also was complaining about poop on their shoes. She went and had a one-on-one -on -one with that other lady who was complaining about poop on their shoes. And they said, you know what? We're going out on Saturday, talk to the dogs who are in the park, owners, to talk about why they have all their dogs pooping in the park and not picking it up. So they went down there and they started talking to the dog 
owners and the dog owners were saying, hey, we actually don't like the fact that our dogs are pooping everywhere. There's no trash cans, there's no boxes around here. And they go, you know what? We can actually go talk to the mayor about our collectively having a problem. There's more longer to the story, but this is all to say, anyone mm. can be a organizer. And I feel like it's my calling actually to lean into um, the faith tradition. A reason why I'm really leaning into Luther Seminary is that Black people, like African Americans in this country for hundreds of years, have used the church as an avenue of organizing and um, a, a avenue of, yes, we want to feed people spirit, but we also want to make sure kids are being fed before they go to school, that our women are safe when they're walking home from work, that children have after school programs, that people are clothed. There's things that my dad was doing in the community that was finding collective problems and trying to solve them in the church. Mm -hmm. And I think leaning into that um, also is, I think changes us from just like meeting people's like spiritual needs to actually what are some earthly problems people are having um, and how can we lean in? And that could be anything out there from there's no uh, trash bins in the park uh, to I'm trying to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Like all those organizers uh, and how we want to lean in is what collective, what we can collectively find out through our churches. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I think that the challenge for us as pastors is, you know, as as people that are visionary and and, and want to do strategic planning and all of that, that that piece of community organizing, our church organizing of getting people to come to the space together at the table and be able to lay those things out and then to be able to come up with a plan to get the garbage bins, to come up with a plan to just have the conversation collectively um, is, is movement. And that's what we, we feel. And I, and I think for some of us that, you know, if you've been in ministry long enough or been part of churches is that a lot of churches look the same that they did 20 years ago because it's comfortable. And we love comfort. It's easy, right? We can, you know, we're, we're, we're Lutheran. So the liturgies, you know, it's, that's part of it too, is that we love tradition. We love the things that are there and present. And as we're seeing, you know, with the pandemic and just all of a sudden we were forced to look at things and go, oh gosh, we got to do things differently. And, and even now, you know, we're nowhere near post pandemic, but even our churches right now are, you know, do we continue doing virtual? Do we continue doing this? What's reaching our communities? What, what is, what are we doing? You know, what's our purpose? Um, and, and trying to identify who we are um, is, is a big space that we're, we're in right now. Um, and so for the pastors listening, you are doing community organizing in some sense. And I encourage you to do more of it with your councils and with your, your leadership and, and the exciting ministries that you have of, let's take a look back and just see what we need to do to move to another spaces. And so, you know, Mike, we, we are in, um, you know, you're a, you're a Wisconsin night, you've been in Minneapolis, you know, almost, almost half your life. Um, yeah. but, um, you know, you are, you're aware of Wisconsin, just kind of like the, the, the context of, of the, the state, you know, as far as rurals and suburbs and farming and all of that. So we're South Central Synod and, you know, a lot of our congregations are vastly different from the one two, two miles down. Um, if I'm a pastor at one of these churches and I, I hear one of my members of my church, you know, in, in response to uh, George Floyd's murder, and they say, well, that wouldn't happen here. Um, they say, well, not in my backyard. Um, I just don't think it's ever going to happen here. What, what do you say to that? Um, I, well, I know what you would say <laughs> to that, but what do we need to say to that? When we lean into these conversations, we're starting, you know, some of this anti-racist work. So we have an incredible racial equity team that um, is really doing some work to help um, some of our congregations lean in, like you've said. Um, but that piece of, well, not here. Well, how, how do you help us with that? Well, I mean, it could be like, um, it could be here. There could be police aggression that comes to, Madison or the suburbs, but I think part of what I want to challenge the not here is to say, 
what happened in America um, after George Floyd was bigger than George Floyd. It wasn't just about getting accountability for these police officers and just about the fact that he was murdered, but what can we all do to actually lean in to make sure everybody's life matters in this country, including mine. And so I think going a little bit, yes, that was so egregious that we're not gonna see a police officer choke out a black man in broad daylight while 17 year olds videotape him. Like that's not gonna happen all the time and that might not happen in rural Wisconsin. Uh, but I think this moment in this country calls for us to take a step further than just saying not in that backyard. But like, what can we do as a church family to deal with equity? And it might not just be like racial equity. It could be equity regarding any community problems that are existing um, that could be addressed. Like um, police killing George Floyd is one scale, but there's still un injustices that are happening in communities everywhere. And I think it's just our calling now to lean into that moment by finding likable conflicts, things that are conflicted, issues that people are having, and what are solutions to those issues. It doesn't have to be just racial justice. Um, but this moment calls for us to lean in about what we can do internally to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for those of you that are, are watching and a part of this, are there, are there any things that are, are coming up um, that you want to ask, Mike, um, or are there things you just want to share about what your congregation is doing? Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of churches that I know um, have, have read some books of, of recent um, that they're, they're starting to do things. Are, are there anything that you guys would like to share in these final minutes with, with Mike and our time together? I do want to share something. I mean, the congregation I'm serving has uh, is 99% white, and the town is 99% white. But um, after George Floyd's murder, there was some energy around that, and there were some protests, and they were 99% white. And I thought, well, I'll go down and see if I could be of use to people and in the protest. And I realized um, my church folks are actually the business owners on Main Street, and when I talked to them, I realized the white business owners, I realized they're terrified because they have completely converged um, Black Lives Matter with Antifa and property destruction. They're just absolutely completely terrified. And so I got a fair amount of traction when conversations with people who are willing to sort of consider Black Lives Matter um, by asking them questions around people or property. Like we're talking about people's lives or property, what's more important to a, a Christian. And then the other thing I did when we had protests was I just went down to the business owners and said, hey, can I come and sit with you that day? They're like, pastor, it's not safe. I'm like, can I just come and sit with you? And so my husband, my beloved spouse and I took our lawn chairs and literally sat with the business owner that was the most terrified, walked across the street to the other business owner and um talked her down. She wore her kindness shirt. She brought one of her friends that were there, you know, whatever kind of stuff, um, talked her down out of her terror. The one we sat with um, actually told me as we were sitting there as her, you know, friends down the street from the business um, that she had been planning to call a white biker gang. And because we sat there to defend the business that she was terrified was gonna be destroyed, her life work. Because we sat there and just said, no, these are just people. They're just talking about news, you know? They're talking about other people's lives. Um, and so, and what the police did that day, there were two police officers, was handed out ice cream cones. You know, so the, the internal narrative um, from my church folks is so divergent from what we know to be true about police violence in um, all over the country um, to the local guys who are handing out ice cream cones. Um, but I felt like we made like an inch of progress that day. Just, and the other thing I felt like I made an inch of progress in my year and a half living here in this town, I've met one black person. I was in the, um, Oh, I was getting my phone fixed. And he was the fellow that day that was helping me out. And it took a good long time. And I was just visiting with him. We, I probably visited with him for two hours and talk about anxiety and suffering. 
by the end of, I used to be a spiritual director. And so I just went there, like what he wanted to talk about, we just went there and then people will come in and then they leave. And then we would just go back to the, like the heart of the soul of being a black man in this kind in this space. And um, it was holy. Mm. I just have to say that, but that's all I got. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I will say, um, thank you for your help. So like, uh, Marie, to your point about like leaning in, you grabbing your lawn chair and you going out there, uh, was leaning in, talking to those business owners, leaning in. Um, I think y'all can take a quote from me, right? Mike Griffin, Black Lives Matter activist in Minneapolis, quote me on this. Very important for central Wisconsin to know this. Black Lives Matter is a overwhelmingly peaceful organization. There have been hundreds of rallies that I've been to for Black Lives Matter where we are nothing but like trying to chant and rally and march and defend black lives there had been a small segment of uh violence that i've seen from all over the place from antifa to white supremacists to all over the place that happened last summer so i do think it's it's important to separate um the nonviolent calls for police accountability and destruction. It doesn't benefit me at all. It doesn't benefit the Black Lives Matter movement to like die or like to like to be unsafe. Like so we are actually pushing safety. We had mask on. We were pushing water. We had overwhelmingly amount of safety at these Black Lives Matter rallies. Uh, so I just want to just like thank you for doing that, Paula. And if we can just continue as we're having any difficult conversations, I know that that's out there. Uh, but Black Lives Matter is peaceful. Mm. Hi, Justin here. Uh, okay. Spent 36 years of my life in South Minneapolis, uptown. What's up? Own house in Northeast. Also spent eight years at Luther Seminary. Oh my God. Um, I'm following your yeah, Eight years, I'll let you know how that worked. But <laughs> it was seminary at St. Convenience because I grew up in Minneapolis. Went to South High School. Uh, went to Oxford College, downtown oh Minneapolis. Um, now serving here in Madison, um, I've seen people, I graduated 2011 from Luther 7, I've seen people of color chewed up by that place. Um, and I know it's changed over the last 10 years, and I know uh, Minneapolis has changed, know this church has changed. The DLCA has grown in its diversity, not because we got more black people, because the white people are leaving and the black people are staying. Mm. So, I, I, Mike, as, as some of the next people who are joining this movement through our seminaries, um, what's your hope? What do you, what, what's next? Like, what are you, give me a little hope, because I've seen, I've been through this, I've been in ministry for more than 25 years here, and I've just seen too much destruction for my brothers and sisters who try to come into this institution that's so primarily white that has no idea what to do, no matter how much we know what to do. I think so what's your um, hope? Yeah, I think the my hope is that the COVID-19 horrible crisis that we all have been forced to live through has uh, forced Luther Seminary to adjust their policies, everything from like not in person classes, I can travel around and be anywhere, not forced to be in a room. I can choose if I want to do in person or not in person. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, there's a focus now on this justice and reconciliation thing where they are actually thinking about wh how can we think about innovating the tr church in a way that is different than waking up with organs and going into a physical church but thinking a little bit differently. And so I really do think that they're really are trying to find people like me who are a little bit different profession, but like wants to reimagine what faith community looks like in the 21st century. And I think post pandemic, we're all are more aptitude to lean into this conversation. I think institutions and church bodies are more likely to lean into how do we innovate? And from this innovation, Justin, I feel like we're gonna find more black folk, find more folks that look like me and have more rep more representation. I work in Detroit. I, I can't tell you how many Elka churches have closed in Detroit. This is before I just spent the last I just spent the last six years serving in Gross Point. Mm. 
So it's just like a reckoning that I feel like we have to do. Um, and I feel like we're all, um, I feel like at least these institutions are starting to do it. Um, I do have a hard stop a minute before this call ends because I can't be late for my other call. I did put my email in the chat. Um, and Marie, I know I got three more minutes left, so pass it to you. Yeah, I just, and that's the thing. I, I love this conversation and you know, I love you, but for all of you that are on this call, I love that you're here. And I, that if you're watching this as far as a recording later on, I want you to be a part of this conversation and we have the racial equity team, but the Senate office, we are welcoming these type of conversations. And that's why equipping the saints has been so fruitful for us because we want to figure out, we want to talk, we want to be open and we, we need to be vulnerable with one another and we need to build relationship and trust. And Mike, for you to join us today, it, it just is a beginning of a conversation. Um, you know, I'll bug you when I want you back. Um, but I just, want to thank you so much just for your ability to to help us understand things that we hear things that we're supposed to be doing but we're like oh i don't know about this you know we have to and and your encouragement and your just gentle empowerment to get us there and and just know you have 26 people that are now going to be praying for you in seminary to just do it because you're our hope you know justin what a beautiful question to ask someone is is what is your hope because you are and you're doing things and everyone on this call you're our hope because you you are in leadership in congregations you're learning um, Steven, I see you on here too. You're in seminary, like you guys are doing this and it's exciting. It's exciting time to be a part of the church because this pandemic forced us into a space that was hard and we're grieving and we're, we're looking at loss all around us. And so what, what comes from loss is growth. What comes from loss is just some sort of hope. And so these conversations are, are what do it. And so Mike, thank you from the bottom of my heart, from the South Central Synod, thank you. Um, but before we go, Bishop Joy, do you mind just praying us away and um, just letting us sit in this conversation um, with Joy? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, Marie, for bringing us Mike. Uh, Marie said when we were brainstorming, equipping the saints, I have the perfect person. Uh, she was indeed right. And so thank you to Marie. Um, just a quick announcement. We um, are next equipping the saints um, is going to be, I think the date is June 2nd. Um, it's coming out in what matters. Some questions for you as we try to figure out how to move forward through the summer with equipping the saints and kind of also hearing from you um, how you want to take these conversations. Are you enjoying the speakers that we're bringing in? Um, do you want a little more homespun? What are you looking for? So in what matters, we have some questions to kind of help us frame the discussion. And if you would uh, give some time to thinking through um, those questions and how we might continue to move forward with these, these conversations, that would be helpful. So that's our agenda for June 2nd. But let us pray. Good and gracious God, we indeed give you thanks for this hour, for the ways that you have opened us up and helped, uh, helped us to consider the ways that we need to um, see ourselves um, a part of all of this and help us to lean in, help us to be brave enough to lean into um, taking risks and taking responsibility to being accountable to opening ourselves up to conversation and relationship. We thank you so much for Mike's leadership, both in Minneapolis and really around the country. And we pray for him as he begins his time at Luther Seminary. We know, Lord, that you are using him and inspiring him and you have given him a voice. And we continue to pray that the Holy Spirit will work and surround him and keep him safe. Thank you, Lord, for the ministries that you have given us. And thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and may Christ go with you this day. Thanks, everyone.